Hey, welcome to Real Life Church Online. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Raul. I am the Student Ministries Director. So glad you're joining us. I want to let you know in a couple of things happening in the life of the church. Last month, we collected candy for our Halloween party. Thank you so much for donating. This entire month, we're collecting toys to take down to a church in Mexico. You can go to reallife.la toys for a list and more information. Really easy gift is a soccer ball or some kind of playground, playground ball to donate to that church. As well as taking toys to Mexico, in January, we're actually taking a trip um, with a group of people from Real Life to help build a church, partner with a local ministry there in Mexico and build a church. So if you want to join us, on that trip to join in Mexico, you need more information. You go to reallife.la slash Mexico for um, what dates, the cost, um, passport information to be a part of that trip, helping another church build a church in Mexico. So, so awesome that Real Life is partnering with ministries and other countries um, this following year and going into next year. Thank you so much for everyone who's been a part of Real Life. Whether you're watching this online, you're sharing with your friends, you're praying for us, um, you're joining us at our prayer nights. We have one this Friday. Um, it's gonna be here at the Valley Center campus at 7 p.m. A prayer night for like, what is that? It's not a typical service with a message. It's an it's a evening where we come together, we listen to some music, we sing some worship songs, and then our lead pastor leads us in some kind of um, prayer. We did a healing prayer one night, prophetic prayer another night. If you're like, what is healing prayer? What is prophetic prayer? We'd love to see you there. If you have any questions, you can go to reallife.la slash prayer. It has all information on there of our prayer nights and prayer classes coming up in the future. Thank you so much for being the church. We get to put on these events. We get to partner with ministries in Mexico, have a pantry because of you. We couldn't do this by ourselves. Life change doesn't happen just from the staff members here at Real Life, but through you, through the way you serve, through the way you partner with local ministries, the way you um, give back what God has given you, um, groceries cost a lot of money. We get, we get to serve hundreds and hundreds of individuals every single month because of the way you partner with the church. If you want to partner with Real Life financially, you can do that really easily today. You can go to give, and it talks you through all the steps of how to partner with Real Life. Again, if you have any questions about what's happening at Real Life, just shoot us an email. You can, go to, you can email us at info at reallife.la. Life Church, God bless you this weekend. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Hope you are uh, closer to friends and family because of this week. Uh, we uh, here at Real Life have been going through a series of teachings on the weekends, uh, looking at the Gospel of Luke and looking at all we have to be thankful for in the life of Jesus. And and what we've seen in the story of Luke is there's this this read that Luke has on Jesus that Jesus is a surprise. Jesus surprised everybody who saw him, his friends, his family, complete strangers, religious teachers, and Luke himself. Everybody was surprised by Jesus. And it reminds me of something that happened uh, at the house of uh, somebody I heard about. They, they, uh, they had this experience where all the time, um, uh, th when, they, when they couldn't find something in the house, they would go and ask mom. And mom would go find the thing they were looking for, and it was always sitting out in plain sight. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it happens often at my house. Uh, Mom, where's the milk? And she says, it's in the refrigerator. And, and me or one of the kids says, no, it's not, I looked. And then she goes, and it's in plain sight, directly at eye level in the refrigerator. And so uh, this family that I heard about, uh, Mom was so frustrated with that, that she put out a jar and she said, okay, from here on out, anytime you ask me to find something in the house, in the refrigerator or anywhere else, and I find it, and it's in plain sight, you have to put $5 in the jar. And uh, this family said that went on for 12 months, and after 12 months with the jar, they bought a new Ford Explorer. And so, so good job, Mom, finding stuff that's in plain sight. Well, Luke has kind of the same feeling about Jesus. Jesus is out there in plain sight, but a lot of us who think we know Jesus are missing him. 
A lot of religious people in his day missed God when God was right there in plain sight. The, the debt uh, that they racked up that way was bigger than the, the $5 Ford Explorer jar. Right? Missing God when he stands right in front of you is a big thing. And Luke wants to make sure we don't miss it. And so Luke is laying out the life and teachings of Jesus and saying, look at what a surprise he was and is. And we've gone through a number of different surprise encounters of Jesus, and now we're looking at the surprise teachings of Jesus. And today we're going to come to another profound teaching of Jesus that is absolutely countercultural. Take a minute and pray with me. Jesus, I thank you that you are a surprise to us, and I thank you that we can discover you again and again, that when we go back to the biblical texts that we thought we've known, we can find again in these texts a God who surprises us, whose love is bigger than we thought, whose grace is more wonderful than we thought, whose persistence in chasing after us is more, is more vigorous than we thought. So Jesus, open up our hearts to your word today and surprise us again. May we know you more. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All right, to understand the teaching of Jesus we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 6, you have to understand the context of the world in which he lived. The Hebrew people had always been a tiny little nation surrounded by great big nations. And they had been conquered again and again because they were always a tiny little nation surrounded by great big nations. In the book of Genesis, towards the end, right uh, and into the book of Exodus, they are in slavery in Egypt. Egypt takes over them and conquers them. Uh, another 500 years later, they are in slavery in Babylon. A great big kingdom comes in and takes them away, and they're off in slavery in Babylon. Uh, they go back and they rebuild their homeland. And then Alexander the Great comes through and conquers everything for Greece. And they're being ruled over by someone else. And then the Romans, Julius Caesar comes in and conquers everything and takes over everything else. There's only one moment in Israel's history where they enjoyed autonomy. And it was when King David was on the throne in Israel. This is the height of Israel's uh, history. It's their golden years it's their peak. King David is on the throne in Jerusalem. They have a temple. They have a city with walls around it and armies. And finally, the land is their own. And they always remember that one time where they got to make decisions for themselves. They're kind of like uh, in a family with lots of kids. There's always the tiniest kid in the family who never gets to make any decisions because all the siblings are bigger than the youngest kid. And all the other siblings make all the decisions. And so when they pile in the car together, the little kid gets put in the back. You have to sit in the back seat because you're the smallest. And when they go out to dinner together, the little kid never gets to make the decision of where they're going to eat because all the older siblings claim uh, authority over the younger one. And if there's one day where maybe it's a birthday and the youngest kid is treated well and told you get to sit in the passenger seat up front and you get to choose where we're having dinner forever after, the kid remembers that day and wants that day again. I wish I was the one making decisions and everybody around wasn't bigger than me. I wish I was the one who got to sit in the front seat. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a silly analogy, but that was the case of Israel. We've always been tiny. There's only been one moment in our history where we got to make decisions for ourselves. Will there ever be a day where we not, are not ruled over by those big nations around us? And so in the day of Jesus, there is bitter resentment towards Rome and towards outsiders, towards Gentiles, Samaritans, those of the surrounding nations. They're bad for us. They pollute us. They're a danger to us. They're a threat to us. They are, they are our enemies. And it's into that context that Jesus teaches this. In Luke chapter 6 at verse 27. Turn your Bible on. Open it up. Follow along. Luke 6, 27. This is Jesus teaching his disciples. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, 
What credit is that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is an upside-down kind of kingdom. In a world where revenge is commonplace, bitterness, grudges, and resentment are standard. The separation between insiders and outsiders is a hard line, and you do not get to cross it. Jesus comes in and preaches, we're going to love those who are different than us. We're going to pray for those who hurt us. We're going to give to those who steal from us. And we're going to be so open-handed with what we own that when we lend it out, we won't demand it back. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus' first message, Jesus' first sermon was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And we usually take that to apply to our individual selves. Repent of your sins. Stop doing bad things. Because God's kingdom is near. And that's certainly true. We should repent from our sins and live holy lives. But kingdoms do not declare war on individuals. Kingdoms come against kingdoms. And I want you to entertain the possibility that when Jesus taught a radical ethic of loving your enemies, it was his kingdom declaring war on the most fundamental kingdoms of this world. Declaring war on the most fundamental values of the kingdoms of this world. Survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog. Kill or be killed. Fight for what you have to have because the world will take it away from you. Those are the fundamental values of the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus said into that, into the, that world, into those kingdoms, give to the one who stole from you. Love them. Don't resent them. Don't demand to sit in the front seat and decide where everybody's going to dinner. Now, I don't know about you, but this teaching from Jesus makes me stop because I think this is the hardest of all of Jesus' teachings. I, I immediately am the kid in the back of the classroom raising my hand and going, wait a minute, I've got some questions about that before you go on. And the questions are, are why and how and why. What about, right? Why, why should I love my enemies? That doesn't make any sense at all. That just makes me vulnerable. It doesn't, it doesn't exact justice from the people who need justice exacted from them. Why should I do that? And even if I agree, even if I say, well, Jesus knows better than me, I guess I'll just try. How do I do it? How on earth do I will myself to love the people that I know I hate? And even if I were to figure out a how in some cases, what about the other cases? What about the cases where it feels dangerous to love your enemies? Well, let's look at each of those three questions. The first two may not be the same question, but they have the same answer. Why should I love my enemies and how should I love my enemies? Th those have exactly the same answer. Why should I love my enemies? Because they can take absolutely nothing away from me that God doesn't want taken away from me. They cannot steal from me anything that God is not attentive to and cannot take care of and repay. It is all in God's hands in the end anyway. And Jesus lived this out at the most critical moment in his life. When he was on trial facing crucifixion, the Romans said, Do you not know that I could have you killed? And Jesus says, You wouldn't have that power if my Father in heaven hadn't given it to you. There is absolutely nothing that this world can take away from you without God allowing it, without God being able to take care of your needs. At, at no point can you be robbed in a way that God cannot take care of. And so, so why should I love my enemies? Well, 
Because God is going to take care of you anyway. You don't need to go around demanding revenge on the people who have wronged you. How do I love my enemies? Same deal. Realize the fact that everything you have and everything you need is in God's hands. And he can take care of you as he wants you taken care of. They, they can't take anything from you. Realize that and live into that. Why should I love my enemies? Well, because I don't deserve any better. I have lived a life in rebellion against God. I have run away from God and rejected God and consciously done things that I know God didn't want me to do. I do not deserve anything better than justice. We deserve God's justice. We deserve repayment for our wrongs. We may, we may hope for mercy. We may hope that he just spares us. But instead, he gives us grace. We deserve justice. We may beg for mercy, but he gives us grace. He loves us and embraces us in our rebellion against him. So why should I love my enemies? Because I don't, I don't deserve anything better than them. How should I love my enemies? I realize that I don't deserve anything better than them. And because I have received such great grace, I can live with great grace. I don't have to go around demanding that the world repay me because my account is not held with the world. My account is held in heaven. And if I am in need, it's God that I appeal to, not the people who have wronged me and stolen from me. The, the why and the how questions have the same answer, right? Why? Because it's all in God's hands. And we don't deserve His grace, but we get it. How do I forgive? Realize the weight of those truths. But then, then you come to the what about question. What about, what about when it doesn't seem like turning the other cheek is a good idea because there's somebody out there who's an abuser or there's real injustice in the world. There, there are really wrongs that needed, need to be righted. What, what about those situations? Well, the answer is, I'm afraid, more obvious than we want, and it might not be the answer that we do want. What did Jesus do in the face of grave injustice? What did he do in the case of the woman caught in adultery who was wrong and deserved to face the law and was dragged on trial to be killed by the religious leaders of her day? What did Jesus do in the face of, of that abuse from people who were hypocrites themselves? He put himself in between them and her and without violence, he spoke truth to power. When they would come against him to take his life, he would, without violence, speak truth to power. And because he lived that way, and because he taught that way, today there are billions of people alive in the world who will put themselves in between injustice and victims and speak truth to power without violence. And that is a kingdom declaring war against kingdoms. That is the kingdom of heaven usurping the values of the kingdoms of this world. And if we are going to follow Jesus, we forsake the values of this world that tell us to get revenge, and we live by the values of the kingdom that say, I have received undeserved grace, and I will distribute undeserved grace. That's the kind of kingdom that Jesus came to create. And that's what he calls us to. Now, I think you and I both know how hard that is and how unlikely that is. We've just been through um, a, a pandemic and a painfully polarizing political season. And, and I'm not sure I, I saw a lot of people living by the values of the kingdom of heaven in that period. I think I saw a lot of people who say that they follow Jesus who very quickly turned to the ways of the world during that period. Uh, I saw people who thought that they were speaking truth to power and that they were standing up in the face of injustice. But I, I did not see a lot of loving enemies and turning the other cheek. But I tell you, love people of the opposite political party do good to those who have different values than you. Don't insult those who insult you, but love them and offer them deep grace. Um, I, uh, I saw a book recently 
a new book that's just come out called Love Your Enemies by Arthur C. Brooks. Uh, and in it, he recounts a number of instances. Uh, he himself is a Christian. Uh, it's not an explicitly Christian book, but he writes of the values of the kingdom. And, and he uh, recounts a number of stories of watching people love their enemies. It's actually a powerful narrative. And he describes uh, one, uh, once in 2017, a march in Washington, D.C. And there was a rally of Trump supporters and a rally of Black, Life, Life Matters, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, protesters. And they met face to face in what promised to be a terrible clash. And there was one leader among uh, the Black Lives Matter movement named Hawk Newsom. And in the midst of this, this growing uh, uh, uproarious anger at one another, the, the, the Trump supporters, the Trump rally, actually did something interesting. They said to him, we're going to let you speak in the microphone for two minutes and say what you want to say. So they gave him two minutes at the microphone. And, and at, at initially there was some... some uh, heckling back and forth, there was some tension, but he said, look, the beauty of America is that when you see something broken, you can fix it. And to his surprise, there was applause on both sides. There was still some tension in the air, but he said, look, I'm an American and I'm a Christian, and what I want is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At this point, someone in the crowd yelled out, all lives matter. And he replied, I agree with you, but the black community feels no justice when black lives are lost. He ended his tense two minutes on this. I want to leave you with this. If we want to make America great, we need to do it together. And the whole crowd applauded. People from both sides embraced him. He said one of the Trump supporters came over and said, hey, will you come over and take a picture with my kids? And he began a relationship with some of the people who had always before been on the other side of the aisle. And he speaks about it now in an interview. And he says that that day changed him. He said, I wrestled with myself for a few months and I decided I would stop blasting people I decided I would go with love. And he says he lost supporters on his own side for that. But he is undeterred. He says, where we're going, we're not going to get there by screaming at each other. When I started that story, if you in your mind went through, I wonder where Pastor Jim is going to land on this one. I wonder if he's going to pick a side or another. I wonder if he's going to burn one side or the other. I wonder if I can even go to this church anymore, right, before he even knew where the story was going. If that's where your mind went, you're exactly who I'm talking to. If you're going to follow Jesus, these are your marching orders. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good and not harm to those who insult you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If they steal from you, give them more. And lend without expectation of repayment. Because this is a kingdom declaring war on the kingdoms of this world. And you have to take a side. Now the, the beauty of this is the vision of what Jesus was wanting. The beauty of this is the promise of what Jesus was building towards. Imagine a world where you walk out your door in the morning and you know there is no one in the world who is going to undermine you if they disagree with you. There is no one in the world who's going to try to, try to cancel you because they don't like what you think. There's no one in the world who's going to try to harm you because you are on different sides of some issue. That's the world that Jesus came to create. And you may hear that and say, that's impossible, that will never happen. That's just not the world we live in, and, and you're right. The world is broken. That is not how this world will be. That's how heaven will be, but that's not how this world will be. So let's make, it, make, make the circle smaller. 
What if we just do that as a church? What if we just carve out one community that lives that way? Not the whole world, because the whole world's not going to be like that. What if just the church is like that? What if just the church lives by the teachings of Jesus? What would that look like? And you still might say, well, that's not going to happen either. That's not the way the church is. And, and you're right. And Jesus said it would be that way. He said you always have the, the wheat and the weeds together. That's, that's the way it is. The church is always going to be a mess. That's just the, the nature of things. So what if, we, what if we try to carve down the circle a little bit smaller? What if we try to make an even smaller circle? What if instead of trying to make the world that way or make the church that way, what if we just make one person that way? What if we make you that way? What if you commit to living by the teachings of Jesus and loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you and not insulting those who insult you and never seeking revenge. Because the God of the universe, the God who created you, came and walked the earth to show you what a life lived in love would look like. And then he went to the cross and he died for you. He gave his life for you to redeem you so that when you believe that he died for you, you are absolutely forgiven. You receive a deep and undeserved grace. Everything you need to live the rest of eternity in, in a beautiful paradise of peace and love has already been provided for you. Out of that wealth of generosity, forsake the kingdom of this world and its values and live by the kingdom of heaven. Whether or not that's possible should be the question that hangs over the head of every follower of Jesus every day. Can we do that? I would propose that if you do it, and I do it, it might just catch on. Let's pray. Jesus, may your kingdom come. We invite you and your kingdom into our lives. Give us uh, the vision from heaven of lives that have been absolutely taken care of and provided for and watched over and given eternity. And may we live in the comfort of that truth. When our instincts, the instincts socialized into us by this world, tell us to get revenge or to hold a grudge or to gossip, Jesus, whisper reminders of your kingdom into our hearts. Keep us on a path of commitment to you. Teach us to love where we are wronged. And teach us to sow grace in a world where there, where there is only resentment. And as we do so, may people see not us, but you. May we be the ones who point their eyes to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us for Real Life Church Online. If this message stood out to you, you can always let us know. You can like, you can comment. Something I like to do is copy and paste the link of the YouTube video and send it to my friends and say, at this moment of the message, uh, Jim said something that really stood out to me. I think it would stood out to you. Uh, we'd love to see you Friday night, 7 o'clock, for our worship and prayer night here at Belly Center. Again, any questions, email us, info at reallife.la. We are praying for you. See you next week.